Harvard Divinity School. Honoring the Dead, Black Film as Ritual Praxis, October 31st, 2023. Good afternoon. Uh, please keep enjoying your lunch and get some food if you haven't gotten some food already. But I'm going to go ahead and, um, while you're munching, give an introduction so that we can get to the event of the day. Um, you know, it's not that often that the Women's Studies and Religion program actually manages to line up with the calendar. But here we are on the eve of the Day of the Dead and All Hallows' Eve and all those other um, things that people are celebrating to honor the dead um, in this talk uh, by Elena Herminia Guzman. And we're so happy to have Elena with us this year in the Women's Studies in Religion program. She is assistant professor at Indiana University Bloomington in the Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies and Anthropology. But if they have a film program, I predict they will shortly be coming after her for a joint appointment because she did her doctorate at Cornell in sociocultural anthropology with a specialization in ethnographic film. And in addition to um, quite a few peer-reviewed publications, she has also made two feature-length, is that right? Feature-length um, films. The first one that she did while she was at Cornell is called Bronx Lives, and it is a collaborative film project exploring the urban landscape of homelessness in the Bronx area of New York City. Um, and the second one, which I believe she's going to tell you about today, is called Smile for Kimmy. Um, and it came out this year. Um, and it's a collaborative feature documentary that explores the intersections of race, gender, and mental health. So thank you so much. I hope, I don't know if I messed up your um, slides here, but um, I, I return the power to you, Elena. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, as we celebrate uh, this particular moment, um, it just so happened to align with the presentation that I'm doing that is called Honoring the Dead, Black Film as Ritual Praxis. So I started building altars before I even knew what an altar was. My father is a born-again born again Christian, but he grew up around the traditions of Puerto Rican Espiritismo and Santeria. He would always proudly talk about his mother and grandmother as powerful brujas or witches. Little did he know that this bruja lineage would continue with me. When I was a child, I would grab my favorite toys, flowers, pictures of loved ones, and put them on a shelf. I had no idea why I was doing it, but something about the collection of all that I held to be precious felt important to me. And now that I'm older and intentionally build altars for my ancestors and spirit guides, I see that the little bruja in me was attempting to demarcate special spaces of reverence. Unbeknownst to me, my ancestors were guiding me in early practices of altar building, shaping and shifting my interests so that by the time I got older, I would understand the magic of altars. In black indigenous native cultures throughout the world, Honoring the dead is a critical practice of life. The dead are not entities to be afraid of or cast away. Instead, the dead, the muertos, the egun, are to be honored and lived with in community. Through offerings of music, water, prayers, and more, we make the dead a part of our daily living. In New Orleans, when a beloved member of the community dies, second line bands with trumpets, dancers and performers take to the streets to celebrate life and honor a life that has passed. In inner city neighborhoods where police brutality takes the lives of black youth, the flickering light of a candle on the sidewalk holds the memory of a lost future. In much of Europe and the Americas, this moment that we are in right now from October 31st to November 2nd are days that honor the thin veil between the spiritual and the physical worlds. 
Altars are filled with pictures, food, and other memories to represent the love and ongoing relationship between the living and the dead during Dia de los Muertos and Fet Gede, which, we'll see, which is a celebration in Haiti. In Jamaica and other parts of the Anglophone Caribbean, Nine Nights is a ritual celebration that marks a transition of a person's spirit from the physical to the spiritual world. We honor our dead because death does not mark an end, but simply a new beginning. It is a sacred moment within the circularity of life that marks a transformation. These performative and material rituals that I shared with you are altars to the dead. They provide us a framework for navigating the immaterial and the internal, death, grief, and the divine. After death catapults those left behind into a state of disassociation and fragmentation, the creative work of culturally specific rituals offers a guide for putting the pieces together in a new form. Altars marked for the dead are worlds of being. It's not simply an ordering of objects, but an intentional marking of space. Fire, water, air, earth. Candles offer light, water acts as a portal, air delivers messages, and earth grounds spirits and their journey to the physical world. Altars not only honor, but hone and evoke sacredness. They serve as transcendent spaces between planes of existence. Crossing from this plane of existence to a spiritual one, where ancestors, spirits, Lua, Egun, and Orisha connect us to different times and spaces. We gain access to sacred knowledge of the past, present, and future. We remember, we connect with those who have passed but are no longer in the physical world. We transcend and we act. In this lecture, I will be focusing on film as a, as a multisensorial altar that transcends linearity and localities, allowing the dead to be active agents within different time spaces. In particular, I will define the concept of black ritual film, which I argue is a specific genre of film made by and for black artists and practitioners that seek to create ritual space through their art. Critical to black ritual filmmaking is what I call a multisensorial theory of the flesh, by which creators and the dead use the senses as a way to create affective and spiritually charged environments with their films. In creating ritual space through film, artists use the dead to facilitate spaces of healing. By embracing a praxis of dreaming, healing, and creation, Black ritual films have the power to visualize and create nonlinear time spaces of black being, belonging, and liberation. The definition, purpose, and structure of ritual has long been debated amongst anthropologists and religious studies scholars. From being a tool of community unity, to representing a cultural's moral ethos, to the mundaneness of habitual everyday action, the importance of ritual has been approached from many angles. However, at its most basic, I see ritual within the religious and spiritual realm as the doing of the sacred. That is, actions done with the intent to bring a person in alignment with an aspect of the sacred and the divine. Whether through a prayer, a gesture, or a communal activity, ritual seeks to use forces of energy, earth, and spirit to bridge the divide between the spiritual and the physical worlds. When a person opens a holy book to pray, they use breath and air to align with and embody the knowledge of the sacred. When a person lights a candle to honor a loved one who has passed, they use fire to activate spiritual energy, to serve as a space of memory, and to bring the dead in community with the living. This is the work of ritual. As M. Jacqui Alexander explains, in practice, the daily living of the sacred ideal in, or the daily living of the sacred in practice occurs in the most simple of acts of recognition, such as pouring of libations for and greeting the Loa, attending to them on days of the week that bear their signature, feeding ancestors first with the same meal we feed ourselves as a way of placing the purpose of our existence back with its source, as a gesture of mutual exchange, and as a way of giving thanks and asking to be sustained. Building an altar to mark sacred ground and focus energies within the home. Constructing a place to work, to touch down, discard, pull in, and practice reciprocity and participating in collective ceremony.
Altars open up sensory worlds, whether the, the smell of sweet cologne, the feeling of heat from a candle, the taste of rum and spirits, the sound of a whispered prayer, the sight of an ancestral apparition. It is through the senses that an altar comes alive. It's a synesthetic environment where sight may come in the form of a smell or the feeling of goosebumps, where touch may reveal sounds. And this is why art plays an important role within ancestor revering. Art is the making of the divine. Within the religion of Ifa, each human, animal, plant, and inanimate object is imbued with the power of the supreme being. Ashe, as it is known, is a life force. When one exclaims Ashe, they are saying the divine into being. The concept reflects the African diasporic ethos of divine utterance in, in which words have the power to bring things into reality. Not only can words bring divinity into reality, but so can creation. In many African diasporic religious traditions, art is an outward manifestation of the divine and thus has the power to bring realities into being. Divine art foregrounds the sensory as an entryway into divine realms. Within this framework, I see black film as an expression of the divine that uses the sensory to bridge spiritual and physical realm, realms. Black ritual film is a particular genre of experimental film created by and for black creatives to open spaces of sacred knowledge, community, memory, history, and healing. At the core of black ritual film is what Tina Camp calls a black gaze, which is, quote, neither a depiction of black folks or black culture. It is a gaze that forces viewers to engage blackness from a different and discomforting vantage point, unquote. Black ritual film doesn't just show ritual, it does the work of ritual. Unlike ethnographic films that explore and analyze ritual within a socio-cultural framework, black ritual films create sensory spiritual worlds that allow people to remember, pray, be in community, and heal. Critical to the creation of black ritual film is what I call a multisensorial theory of the flesh. It is both a theory and a method in which the sensory is used to relay the sacred knowledge of the flesh, flesh in service of spirit. Within a religious context, both the Torah and the Christian Bible have defined the flesh as a site of sin. And, this part, and, and it is this part of us that becomes alienated from the divine. And here are some examples of um, different Bible passages, different passages that um, define the flesh as sinful, and I'll focus on the last one. Uh, the flesh fuels sin. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immortality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Within religious texts, the flesh is viewed as, a part, as the part of ourselves and desires that alienate us from the divine. But women of color feminist scholars have attempted to reclaim definitions of the flesh. Feminist Chicana scholar Sherry Moraga defines the flesh as, quote, one where the physical realities of our lives, our skin color, the land or concrete we grew up on, our sexual longings, all fuse to create a politic born out of necessity, unquote. For women of color feminist scholars, the flesh is one that is political, it is embodied, and it is bound to the land. This represents a distinct break within Cartesian notions of which the body-mind are split and instead recognizes land and the systems of power as co-constitutive of the body. It is what Anna Marie Laura calls body lands, the Afro-Indigenous belief that our bodies are not separate but a part of the land and the spirits around us. This is the theory of the flesh. It is a space of empowerment rather than alienation. Black feminist scholars such as Hortense Spillers and Tiffany Ltavo King have attempted to understand the flesh by considering the experiences of the, uh, of the flesh within the framework of the transatlantic slave trade. The flesh is the prediscursive black body before it has been contained and defined by the schemas of racism, gender, sex, sexism, patriarchy, and other systems of oppression. Black flesh is the location at which whiteness wages its struggle for power and captivity of the black and native other. And because of this, 
this, the flesh becomes also a site of liberation. A multisensorial theory of the flesh is one that creates sensory spiritual worlds to both recognize and bring into, bring into being spaces of liberation and healing, where sensory feelings of pleasure, ecstasy, and joy are not sinful, but instead bring us further in alignment with the divine. I see the flesh not only as the physical material, materiality of the body, but also the site of the metaphysical, that which exists within and beyond the physical body. Black ritual films employ a multi-sensory theory of the flesh as a way to foreground the sacred knowledge that emerges from the sites of our minds, lands, bodies, spirits that are deemed sinful, contaminated, and in need of being contained. The sensory rendering of the flesh thus becomes a visual mapping of freedom. I came to the ideal of ritual fil filmmaking in my own practice making the film called Smile for Kimmy. Smile for Kimmy is a short hybrid documentary that uses animation and live action footage to tell a story of how two friends transcend time, space, and their struggles with mental health to find that even beyond death, their friendship lives on. The film is deeply personal and shares my own story grieving my friend Kimmy after she passed away in 2016. In many, way, in many ways, the film became the medium through which I was able to express my grief and to visualize futures um, to visualize futures uh, that weren't going to happen and honor her memory. The film draws from my own spiritual practice as an espiritista within the practice of Puerto Rican espiritismo, which is also known as spiritism. Spiritism is a practice that is made popular throughout, through, um, throughout the Latin America, and is, it was made popular through the writings of Allan Kardec. Throughout Latin America, believers create what are known as bovedas, or sacred altar spaces. And these bovedas are used as a way to communicate with the dead and spirit guides. The altar is a space that allows us to make the dead a part of our daily living. After my friend Kimberly passed away, my boveda was a place that I would honor and commune with her. I would put out coffee at M&M's, which were her favorite candy, um, as libations and offering to her spirit. Soon, my boveda practice would move from a physical altar space to a visual one through this film. So here is a short animation that shows the um, altar that was animated in the film itself. <laughs> Was there ever a time when you just felt like it was too much? Too much in terms of? Like with uh, everything that I was dealing with and just the idea that I could possibly not be here anymore um, and like what that would mean and how different that would be for you in your life and stuff. Was there ever a time when you just wanted to give up or you felt like it was just too much? It wasn't fair that people could come in and out of your life to the extent that they wanted to or interact with you only in a kind of distant way or whatever was more convenient to them. I wanted you to be in my life because I appreciated everything that you brought to my life. And I was gonna do it in a way that wasn't like half in, half out. It was gonna be like all, you know, all in. I always feel like I'll feel better if, but all those ifs are so far away. Like I, if I have my two year degree, if I have a husband, if I have kids or something like that and I just, don't know what it feels like to be happy for long enough to accomplish any of those things. I figured if I couldn't, you know, give anything to the world or make anybody proud or feel good about myself, then there was no reason for my existence. I mean, whatever energy I had when I woke up was spent figuring out how I was going to kill myself. I get frustrated for myself and other people because I feel like everybody's trying to fix me 
and I'm unfixable. It ends up becoming more about them than it is you because they want to be the hero. And if you die, then they're going to feel guilty. And my depression is not about anybody else, it's about me. Was there ever a time when you just wanted to give up or you felt like it was just too much? So in making this film, I made the intentional decision not to show the physical altar that I dedicated to Kimmy, but instead to render it through animation. This decision has much to do with the limitations of camera and technology to capture that which is sacred and spiritual. Had the camera actually captured the altar space, what we would have seen is a staging of objects, a representation of an altar. But when I create an altar space, just like we saw in this um, animation, an entire new world opens up for me. When I light a candle at my altar, it is not simply the act of striking a match and lighting a wick, but instead an entire world opens up for me. While live action footage can capture a moment in time, it is unable to capture the unseen. By using animation, Smile for Kimmy represents the lived and affective experiences of these ritual and spiritual worlds. In making Smile for Kimmy, I began to realize the kind of film that I was making was a different kind of film. In the same way that I collected items as a child and built altars unknowingly, in this film, I was engaging in a praxis that I didn't have words for. I began searching for other kinds of films that did the work of ritual, and I slowly began curating a list of films, talking to filmmakers, and soon realized that the kind of filmmaking that I was engaging in was not a singular experience, but a collective one. I saw other black women filmmakers from different locations within the African diaspora creating ritual films as a way to change the visual landscape in which, practice, in which our practices are represented and also visualize geographies of liberation and healing. To further illustrate the potentials of black ritual film and its use of multi-sensory theory of the flesh, I will examine two films made by black women and non-binary artists. In reading these films together, my goal is to demonstrate a particular practice of filmmaking that uses ritual to create alternative geographies of diaspora. Within these borderland spaces exists freedom and liberation created through, liber uh, through uh, ritual practice. The first film is Water Ritual Number no. One, An Urban Rite of Purification um, by Barbara McCullough. It is a short experimental film that follows a young woman performing a series of rituals on a desolate urban landscape. Shot in black and white, 16 millimeter film stock, the film itself is accented, as we see in this photo right here, with infrared color contrasts, creating an otherworld, otherworldly ethereal aesthetic and spiritual present. The soundscape has jazz motifs and improv in the background and serves as a ritual landscape accentuating the diasporic sig significance of improv and ritual practice. The film focuses on gestural, gestural and embodied aspects of ritual. Rather than representing a particular religion or practice, the rituals in the film represent a mosaic of African spirituality and culture that took its own shape in the new world. From the soulful jazz of Steve Wa Stevie Wonder to the grinding of maize or corn, each item is a sacred calling to the vast geographies of the African diaspora. Explaining how she decided upon the ritual shown in the film, the director Barbara McCullough states, quote, I wanted to manifest what was going on in my consciousness and also unconscious level, but I wanted to do this by way of honoring my ancestral cellular memory because I felt very much that there were entities around me thrusting me in a very gentle way, but to do more, to seek more." Unquote. In the background of a desolate urban landscape in Los Angeles, we see a series of decaying buildings that hold the memories of African American communities who were evicted by the city through eminent domain. This location was the site of a freeway building project of I-105 in uh, Watts, California, and remained abandoned for decades. The location served as inspiration for the director, Makala, because it visually represented the paradoxes of modernity. 
In the film, a young woman sits open leg on the cement floor around a circular uh, sacred space of objects. We see cowrie shells, coconuts, a Stevie Wonder record, and other random objects belonging to the desolate space itself. And within the sacred circle are, are remnants of memory, ritual, and history. The woman picks up maize and begins to grind it into dust. As a ritual action, the grinding of maize is a manipulation and extraction of the powers that reside in the natural world for ritual purposes. The young woman then claps the maize in her hand, activating the sacred power of the maize by creating friction with the earth and in doing so, releasing energy. Bringing her ritual to a close, the camera then focuses in on the young woman as she squats down and urinates on the ground. The close-up Im image is slightly distorted with infrared colors and uses negative contrast um, to, so that we are not able to see the full picture. We see a stream of urine coming from the woman's body. This particular ritual foregrounds how the flesh, and in this case, fluid, are critical to ritual practice. Urination is the body's own internal purification process, yet at the same time, within this ritual, the woman's bodily fluids represent the purification of the urban landscape that was allowed to decay in the name of urban modernization. Water and fluids are a critical part to ritual practice because it also feeds the dead, it contains power of various entities and spirits, and it can act as a portal between the living and the dead. The focus on urine as a purifying force challenges religious notions of fluids being a site of disease and contagion, and instead a site of healing and purification. As Mary Douglas notes, Christian theology sees impurity and uncleanliness as belonging to the realm of the wicked. Many Abrahamic religions take up this etho ethos, whether through the practice of washing certain body parts before prayer, restrictions around menstruation, or rules around sexual hygiene. Bodily fluids like sweat and urine are understood as sites of impurity and contagion. Yet, in water ritual number one, the flesh, or in this case the urine, is presented as a site of liberation. For Makala, urine serves as a purification of the urban landscape that displaced hundreds of families in the name of modernity. Within the site of the flesh, black women's bodies and excrements purify landscapes of urbanization in order to foreground the history of African-American communities that live there. In this film, the camera is not a spectator, but rather a participant in the ritual, inviting the viewer into the ceremony to remember a history that was erased. When a ritual film is created, the relationship between audience and filmmaker changes. No longer are the audience members passive observers, but they are invited into the ritual. Every screening of the film involves a ritual act of remembering and connecting to sacred knowledges. It requires an embodied response that engages your various sensory registers in the same way that an altar does. Ritual film not only asks you to participate, but also to act. The sacred knowledge in which you are given requires action. When one engages in ritual to access sacred knowledge, the expectation is that the messages you receive will be applied to your life. For example, if you go to a spiritual store or how they're referred to botanicas and you get a reading, the person divining the messages will offer you a series of advice for your life, ranging from your love life, job, health, your past experiences and possible futures that can be diverted. And at the end of the reading, the diviner might give you a, what I call a spiritual prescription. So they'll say something like, light a candle for seven days to this saint and wear this stone uh, whenever you're outside. While these messages and these kinds of uh, readings are individualized to the person's past, present, and future, and destiny, a black ritual film offers scripts for community action. It visualizes black diasporic belonging, mapping landscapes in which we are loved, and community, and healing the landscapes around us. This film posits black women's bodies as a site of healing and purification. Water ritual number one uses fragmentation as a practice of sensory world building. The fractured images created by close-ups and particular angles move us in and out of the ritual space of the film. Rather than presenting the ritual as linear or as a particular set of movements, the film fractures our view and presentation of coherent time space. The focus on gestures of ritual like grinding, clapping, and prayer allow us to be enmeshed within a synesthetic affective environment. The sound of a clap activates energies and feelings of touch for the viewer. The sight of being of the, the sight of power being powder being blown into the air activates a, a sense of touch and smell. 
Like any ritual or ceremony, what the audience takes from the ritual depends on the person's own embodied response and history. But collectively in watching this film, we are being asked as a community to remember and consider the purification that we may need individually and collectively. Explaining the ritual intention of the film, Barbara McCullough states, quote, I wanted to discover my link with the female person to ritual, but also to practice that would really enable me to go through a cathartic practice whereby I was cleansing and going through that ritual process. So that was really the beginning for me to open the ideal of this film. Maybe I can perform my own ritual and I can go through my own cleansing, but not just for me, for my society, other black people to enable us to move from one space of maybe lack of clarity to another space where we can purge and clean and clarify and dispel societal ills and not be stuck in them." Unquote. And watching Water Ritual number one, looking becomes a political act. It's not simply a matter of seeing, hearing, sensing, and understanding, but instead it's a conversation by which the viewer and the filmmaker engage in a dialogue one that is deeply personal and dependent upon the viewer's own embodied engagement, and one that is communal as well, a dialogue that the audience takes away from watching film. Water ritual number one is a ritual of purification and remembering whereby the flesh is a site to remember those who have been dispossessed, but also a sacred place by which these toxic histories and systems of power can be purified, ejected, and cleansed on an individual and communal basis. The second film I'll be analyzing is called Between Starshine and Clay, uh, and it's by an organization called Lead to Life, uh, which is a racial and environmental justice organization that uses ritual and ceremony to create spaces of black wellness. The title of the film takes inspiration from Lucille Clifton's poem called Won't You Celebrate With Me? In the poem, she says, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me but failed and has failed. The poem represents the core mission of the ritual at the heart of this film. Between starshine and clay, between the heavens and earth, exists a horrid reality in which black people are constantly faced with the possibility of death. Structural and state violence are constant realities, yet, Lucille Clifton still asks us, won't you celebrate with me? The ceremony in this film is a collective community ritual that took place in 2019 on Martin Luther King Jr. Day at Oakland City Hall to commemorate the life of Oscar Grant and, and the countless other people who have been murdered by police. Using Christina Sharp's definition of the wake as interludes, between starshine and clay uses ritual to do the work of the wake. Sharp sees the wake as, quote, living in the afterlife of property, unquote, by which black people must exist within the imminence of death slash dying. Thus, wake work is work that seeks to depict and disrupt the paradox of black being within the afterlife of slavery. The film states, quote, in collaboration with community members across California who have been impacted by police brutality, domestic terrorism, gun violence, indigenous displacement, and environmental racism, we gather to imagine our people in the land well and cast our prophecy into the stars. The film is a ritual remembrance that seeks to illuminate the violence of police brutality while also creating a, a space for people to celebrate black life within the paradox of black death. Throughout the 12 minute film, we are moved between multiple time spaces. The first is the ritual space and the ceremony that took place in Oakland commemorating the lives lost to police brutality and gun violence. In these clips, we see community members gathering, altars erected to memorialize the dead, songs, dancing, and storytelling. And we also see the ceremonial destruction and transformation of a gun. Audience members who are watching this community ritual are invited through the film itself, audience members who are watching the film and the community ritual are invited to a moment of the past within the present in order to imagine alternative futures free of uh, police and state violence. The ceremony is a call to action for both the people who attended the ceremony in person and the people who are participating in this ritual virtually on the screen. The audience members again are called to action, not as passive viewers, but instead as active agents. When a ritual is performed, 
a series of spir uh, spiritual currents, or what are known as corrientes, are conjured and coexist within a ritual space. These spiritual currents represent the presence of spiritual entities. Corrientes, or spiritual currents, can be a felt phenomenon. For example, a tingle or a strange feeling in the body, a whisper that you may hear. By some, it might be heard or spoken through a person, and sometimes it might be shown in a flame or in water put on the altar. In her book, Electric Santeria, Aisha M. Belicio de Jesus explores how media and technology are changing the religious landscape of Santeria trans transnationally. She argues the filming and transmission of rituals allows practitioners to partake within the ritual from afar. Through technology, electrical currents of the film allow viewers to also experience the spiritual currents of the ritual space of the ceremony that was recorded. In other words, technology has the power to transmit the visual, sonic, and spiritual currents to the person watching the film. Therefore, there is a resi residue of the spiritual currents that can be felt by viewers. In watching between starshine and clay, viewers become active participants of this ritual through the spiritual currents of the ritual itself. The sensory environment of the film creates a spiritual space in which the viewer can feel and participate in the act of remembering the dead. In addition to the ritual we see on screen, the film offers an alternative visual space filled with ritual performance. In this space, we see four people dressed in all white with their faces painted, holding shovels, moving and dancing in ceremony together towards the beach. The shovels represent the disconnection and dispossession of black and native people from the land. The ceremony uses shovels as a hope for a future in which we are connected to the land. Within African diasporic religions, land is a critical part of our practice. We protect the water because it feeds and nourishes the land and our bodies, but also because in the water exist Simbis, La Sien, Oshun, Yemaya, and Mamadlo. The water is where the spirits of our dead go. To protect the land is to protect our spirits, is to protect our ancestors, and is to protect our futures and past. As they reach the water in the ceremony, they hold a metal star. The metal stars being used in the ceremony are the stars that were created during the Oakland community ritual when they ceremonially, ceremoniously transform the metal of a gun into stars. The use of fire ritually transformed the violence of the gun into the stars of Clifton's poem. The gun representing state violence and land, land dispossession is ritually cleansed with the waters of the ocean. Describing the goal of the film, the artist write, may this film inspire you to return to ceremony, the healing power of community, the divinity of black people, and the sacredness of all life. May it give respite and hope to other families mourning their beloved ones. We will continue to speak their names, Ashe, unquote. The sacredness of the film seeks to inspire, give respite, and hope, and serve as a space of memory for the dead. In this rendering, the flesh is the site at which we recognize the paradox of black life and death and the dead who are taken away by state violence. The flesh is also the site in which we heal this immense paradox through ritual. So to offer concluding thoughts, I'd like to make a brief offering to this ideal, this altar here, this visual altar here, um, about the concept of black ritual film. Liberation is a battle that's fought on multiple fronts. As a practitioner of different African diasporic religions and practices, I see the role that ritual art and film plays in our path to liberation. Through film, we have the potential to enact the sacred, to bring our minds and bodies closer to the divine, to recognize black as divine, to honor the dead, is not to focus on death, but instead, in the case of black ritual film, is to focus on black aliveness. Black ritual film is about community and it's about healing. Collective grief is all around us. What I see as the power of black ritual film is that it allows us to engage in ritual in order to envision futures of black liberation. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, thank you for um, this really insightful presentation that brings us both into your work and how it's connected to other work that exists out there that's kind of doing um, similar uh, labor, if you will. Um, I wanted to know if you could speak to um, this notion of the dead as collaborator um, that I feel like um, you bring up. I'm wondering kind of like, did it come up for you in the making of this film? And then kind of like beyond that, how can we think about it in relationship to um, black film as ritual? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, so um, it, it's, it's interesting because this is the exact topic that we're talking about in my class uh, this week. So it's, uh, it's fresh in my mind. But um, um, we are reading the book of Solima Rotero, who, who's actually a, a WSRP fellow here. Um, her book is called Archives of Conjure. And um, I had mentioned in class, I think one of the biggest uh, contributions of that book is that she posits the dead as active agents within our scholarship. And I think that's really important because if you think about history, History, if you think about the archive, oftentimes we piece together these stories of people who have passed um, with the limited information that we have. And so what, th in thinking about the dead as active agents, it's really not only piecing together with what is left in the material world, but also how can we bring the spiritual uh, in it as well. And so um, how can spiritual methods such as divination, um, spiritual materiality, material culture, how can all of these things come in to create a more fuller picture? Um, and so I see the dead as active agents because in all of these films, the dead are an active part of telling their story. And so um, for people who um, practice within these religions, it's very well known that if you're going to be doing anything on the dead, you have to ask permission first. And so I couldn't give this presentation about my film or talk about my film or I couldn't have done this film without the permission of my friend who passed, not only in the time when she was living, but also um, afterwards as well. So this permission, I think people get in a variety of ways, um, but is primarily through divination. And so when I was making this film, it came to me in a lot of different ways um, in Smile for Kimmy. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, the film kind of became a site for me to both mourn and grieve her and also became like a living altar to me. And so because of that, I started receiving um, lots of messages from her that helped guide the making of the film. Um, so the first one that's in the film that I didn't show but is a, a important part of the film is um, a dream that I had after she passed away. And for me, this represented the message that she gave me about the conditions of her passing because at that point I didn't know. I just know that she passed away. Um, but it represented a really important spiritual message for me. And so I decided to include that in the film as a kind of alternative site of knowledge and thinking about the dead and also how the messages that the dead are giving us as well. And so we use animation to render that because it was this, obviously it's a dream so it's hard to recreate um, through just kind of uh, like a performance or acting or something like that. Um, so you know there were many moments in, in the film in that sense and then there were also moments where myself and other people in the film who were practitioners as well would do divination and commune with Kimmy, my friend, um, just to be like, okay, how are you thinking? So throughout the making of this film, just dreams and messages I would get sent. And so that is the praxis of, I think, um, making the dead active agents um, within the making of the film. And I think within bro uh, more broadly within black ritual filmmaking, it's also a critical practice as well because the dead are not so much a haunting in the kind of negative way that we think. We think of haunting as like, oh, this scary thing that we don't know what to do with, but it's more so a haunting on the conditions of colonialism and racism. It's a haunting that is trying to bring those to light rather than the dead being the haunted. It's the conditions, right, um, which allowed them to be in the position of having to transition, right? That is the haunting that is being um, illuminated through black ritual film. Thank you very much, Elena. It was really interesting, especially after I watched that movie. I couldn't, I hardly could concentrate on oh. what you are saying. <laughs> My mind invited me to come back to those images. Mm. It was really beautiful. Thank you. Um, my question is about the 
the very rituals that you talked about and the metaphysics behind that rituals. Um, you said that the community categorizes people into bad, good, or moral and immoral when you speak about uh, purifying and the impure people. Uh, but when it comes to the dead uh, realm, the, the realm of those who have passed away, it seems that everything is completely bright. Mm. Everything is completely entirely good, and there is no talk about someone who is died and she or he has been impurified. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, how does the community encounter when I die and I'm not purified before mm. I, mm. I die? How, how do they encounter this? And is there any metaphysics about my body when, I'm, when I die? Is my body a site for any continuation of mm. being purified? Or is it, is it regarded as something dark or mm. something that should be purified? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think it's, um, the answer to that is very much going to depend on the spiritual tradition. Um, what I would say in, like, in, in my own practice of Puerto Rican Espiritismo, um, there are these ideals of, um, there's, there's this ideal that there's all these spirits that are around us. There's elevated spirits, there are prophets, there are um, spirits that haven't transitioned, that are still trying to stay on this, uh, this, er this physical realm. There are spirits who, um, who um, are like malignant and just seeking to like take your light and life force. So there's diff lots of different kind of spirits. Um, and so um, they're not seen as like good or bad. They're just seen as entities. And then it's up to us to determine how exactly we navigate that relationship. And so let's say that there is like a malignant spirit that is causing me issues for some reason. Um, it's not like this is a bad um, spirit that needs to be cast to hell, right? <laughs> it's not like that kind of uh, idea. It's more like maybe this is a spirit that needs water. Maybe this is a spirit that needs light and prayer. Um, and so I think that uh, the idea of purification in the dead, um, th it, that kind of divide or that binary of good and evil doesn't necessarily exist. And so when someone passes away, they're not necessarily absolved of everything that happened to them in life. Um, it's their mission in the afterlife to seek an elevation, to seek elevation essentially. And so there's kind of two different spaces. And the spirits who seek elevation and are able to get elevation, those are the ones that can guide us in this physical realm. Everyone else, we kind of have to be a little bit more careful with. <laughs> um, so that is just, like I said, dependent on the tradition. Um, but I do think that there is something important about like the moral, um, the moral kind of judgment that comes with this idea of like purity and contagion or um, whatever the like the the kind of ways that we've been taught to think about the dead. That that's not necessarily something that. Um, exists within the spiritual practice itself. It's more so just the kind of continuum of what is possible. Um, and then the body itself is seen as the kind of physical vessel. And once that body, once the spirit has been ritually um, allowed to ascend, then those ideas of purification are not, oops, excuse me, not placed onto the body anymore. That's just kind of the, the vessel in which it no longer exists in. Thank you so much for this presentation, um, Professor Guzman. Um, my name is Rebecca. I'm a student in Professor Guzman's <laughs> class. Um, I'd love if you could speak more to the idea of the camera as not a spectator, but a participant in ritual practice, and what responsibilities that puts on the filmmaker um, when you are bringing the camera into a sacred ritual space. Because um, I think one of the recurring themes that um, came up in the presentation is that um, we don't want to be like a voyeur, um, especially with like sacred um, rituals and practices that practices that not that aren't that aren't sometimes aren't meant to be seen. Um, I think that's why you use animation in certain um, spaces. Yeah, I'm thinking of like talking more to this idea of the camera as an active participant in um, ritual practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that um, 
So kind of, I guess, thinking in my own experience of um, the films that I've seen that kind of present ritual like from an ethnographic perspective is that I started to get very frustrated because um, its goal was to create or attempt to recreate the massiveness of what a ritual is. And so I noticed that, you know, even though it could show, it, it could be a five hour film if it wanted to, and it could show every single aspect of the ritual, but it could never fully capture actually what that ritual was and the worlds that opened up. And so with the animation that I showed, um, what I wanted to show was how when I sit at my altar, a whole world opens. And so that's why the flowers kind of go into these memories and these worlds. Um, I wanted to use this kind of alternative means of representation for that. And so I think that there's limitations when it comes to documentary ethnographic films because they are there's a concern, as with any science, um, with like a kind of real, quote unquote, real representation. Um, and so in making this, I was less, I was less concerned about what real meant in that sense and more about what real meant to me. Um, and so in making the choice to not actually document my camera, there was a kind of refusal that happened there on my part. And I think with the, uh, the case of other films as well, um, really the ideal, I think for the, the camera is to be aware of where you're invited, where you're not invited, but also um, to have a deep understanding of how this representation could be very limited and what can you do to try to make that more robust or try to represent another kind of aspect of it. I think that's the big question that I think filmmakers, uh, people who are going into ritual spaces need to ask because um, these spaces are, um, they're hidden for a lot of different reasons and there needs to be a respect for that. And at the same time, I think there are other ways we can represent aspects of the ritual without directly kind of filming them. So for me, I see it as a kind of refusal that takes part on the part of the filmmaker or the uh, filmer, but also the person that's filming. But also I think it's, um, uh, you kind of need to know or have a bit of a deeper knowledge about the religion itself, whether as an insider or outsider, whatever that means, but understanding what exactly it, it is that you're representing, uh, how people understand it. I think that's where the value of ethnography can come in. Uh, and then after that, kind of making decisions from that ethos rather than an ethos of like a Western extractive point of view. Um, thank you. This was this was really beautiful. Um, so I had a couple of related questions, but but first um, I'd love to hear about the maker of the illustrations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yes, yeah, so I was wondering if in some of the rituals are there um, are there remnants or elements of Catholic or Christian traditions, um, or maybe even you know uh, maybe even from Islam. Um, and then, you know, I'm already anticipating teaching your work in my <laughs> sociology religion <laughs> class, so I'm excited about this. Um, how, how or where do you distinguish between like religious versus spiritual since we're always like brushing up against that binary? Um, you know, because sometimes you call them, um, you know, Afro-Diasporic religions and the other time is spiritual pra practices. So yeah, how do you, how do you think about that? Elena, can I just add in while you're helping us situate Espiritismo, um, Alan Kardec, uh, that just seems um, so out of context. So <laughs> where does uh, the dissemina dissemination of his ideas fit into this? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the illustration here is uh, from one of the animators of my film. Um, their name is Malachi Lilly, and they're a black non-binary spirit worker. Um, and so this illustration um, was an, is concept art for early part of the film when we were talking about what we wanted the altar to look like. Um, and so without telling them anything, um, I just asked them to kind of like make an altar space because it was just uh, concept art, so it wasn't anything that needed to be um, accurate, um, and they made this, and uh, it's something that I just kind of fell in love with thereafter, um, because it's they they use like their own kind of divination practice to think about what would be on the altar, um, and one of the figures that they present here is um, Our Lady of um, Our Lady of uh, Regla. Sorry, I don't know the word in English. Uh, Catholic saint, um, Our Lady of Regla, who. Um, 
is syncretized to um, the Orisha Yamaya. And so that is um, my spiritual mother in, in, uh, in Santeria. <laughs> so before even knowing or asking me, it's something that she was able to put into the altar. So this is like a deeply kind of multifaceted history that's kind of just here, um, all the layers of this film here. Um, so I think uh, that part also speaks to your second question about the kind of Christian Catholic aspects, um, which is that, um, of course, because of the slave trade and because um, a lot of um, African people and African descended people were uh, banned from actually practicing their religions, a lot of uh, uh, practitioners, whether in, um, in, in lots of parts of the Caribbean and Latin America, but um, in uh, Lukumi, Santeria, and Vodou, use Catholic saints as um, as like a mask for the African gods that they were praising. And so um, Our Lady of Regla became, it was Yamaya. Jesus was um, syncretized to, so people would put crosses on their altars, but it was actually supposed to be in praise of another Orisha named Babalu, Babalu I, 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 Aye, who is like a, the Orisha of like health. Um, so all of these kind of aspects kind of um, got hidden, I would say, within these altar spaces that looked very Christian Catholic, um, but, you know, um, <laughs> held a, a different meaning to it. So those parts were um, kind of a, a secret language, but also it became very much incorporated within the religion as well. So a lot of people who practice uh, Lukumi, Espiritismo, also have their other religious faiths as well. And so a lot of people are Catholics, they go to church, and then they have their like sacred Boveda altar as well. They don't see them as kind of going against each other. Um, and so um, I think the interesting thing is with Espiritismo, it's seen as a practice that um, goes very much in alignment with a lot of the major religions of the world because the idea is that um, we do not know the expanse of knowledge of this world, right? And so God create God not only created us, but there's spiritual entities as well, and then some people have the power to be able to relate to them and be in communion with them. Um, so um, people's both of us, there's different, or at least in Espiritismo, there's these ideas of... Um, you have, um, every person has like a court of spirits that um, guide them in particular, and they're uh, broken down by race and culture. So there's the uh, commission of, um, uh, that are called hitanas, which is like, uh, means gypsy, but uh, it's for the, it talks about the Roma people. So um, there's the commission of hitanas, there's the commission of uh, Native Americans, there's the commission of Congo, there's the commission of Arab, Asian, there's all of these different commissions. So you can have someone who has like a Buddha on their altar right next to their cross, uh, their like <laughs> a Christian cross, right? So um, that is not seen as contradictory in any way because of this kind of history uh, of uh, inter just the international um, or the transnational uh, world that these religions are coming from. Um, and so kind of um, going to the question of Alan Kardec, I think um, that also is very similarly falls in line with what I'm saying here in that um, Alan Kardec kind of, he wrote these uh, books and teachings thinking about the science of spiritism and communicating with spirits. And um, they became so popular in Europe that they became then disseminated throughout Latin America, had their Spanish translations in Latin America and became a practice, a kind of Creole practice, I would say, a Creolized practice within Latin in America. So uh, Espiritismo is practiced in conjunction with a lot of other religions, um, African diasporic religions, including um, Santeria, Lukumi, um, Hoodoo, Conjure. People will use these religions in conjunction, or Christianity, like I said, go to church and then go pray onto, onto their altar. So um, that just became one of those things that because it was like such a, because it was a practice that used the Bible so significantly within the praise of, or within the um, communication of spirits, it became very popular throughout Latin America. Um, so that's where all Alan <laughs> Kardec um, comes in. And then um, to the question of um, religion versus spirituality, I don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> um, what I would say is I was kind of, I, I am rifting off of um, what in African diasporic religion um, studies is known as ATRs, so African traditions, religions, um, and spiritualities. Um, and so traditions are like more those that are considered to be um, like 
are, sorry, religions are considered to be those that have that kind of like historic practice where spirituality is more like kind of the espiritismo, more so a practice that uses other religious as a background. So, um, but yeah, that's the only answer I have to that. <laughs> I, can't, I can't answer that. That feels like a big uh, philosophical question that I don't have the answer to. <laughs> So in a lot of ways, you actually answered my question in answering Vereen's, but I wanted to ask a little bit more about sort of how these traditions are situated in community, um, particularly given community members who may have really strong allegiances in areas of Christianity that, you know, it's one thing, um, I guess I'm, I'm interested more about how, how Christianity sometimes boundary polices. Right, and so what that looks like in family contexts, is it, is it the case that like basically, you know, practitioners don't see there as being a contradiction, and so across families that's the case, or are there moments when somebody, because of their relationship to an evangelical or born again form of Christianity or to the Catholic Church where, where tension is created and how is that navigated? Um, I'm also interested in sort of the, the tensions and dynamics um, between the liberatory um, sort of aspects and, and mission and hope of the practices that you're talking about that are also part of Christian traditions, but Christian traditions also as part of a colonizing sort of power and often patriarchal power structure. So I guess the last piece of that would also then be the gender dynamics of those spaces and how those, how those play out. So basically, say more about what you were already talking about, is I think the best way to put that. Um, one thing I will say is that um, with these practices that we see, um, like the use of syncretized, creolized religions, where we see the use of um, saints in different um, Christian iconography, it was primarily in countries that had um, that were Catholic. Um, and so I think there was this ideal that the Catholics were like, okay, we'll we'll turn our head, you know, and let you have your carnivals, <laughs> um, but make sure you come back to church. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that um, that is an important aspect of it. It. And so, Christi, or sorry, excuse me, Catholicism, um, the reason why there was the ability to create that syncretizing uh, between, let's say, Lukumi or Vodou, is because of the um, prominence of saints within Catholicism. And so, if you're praying to a saint, um, nobody's really going to ask a question, whereas in other religious sects, like Praying to saints is not something you just pray to God, right? Um, so um, that I think that's the that's I think an important distinction to make for sure is that Catholicism plays a really big part uh, within the Christian aspect of a lot of these um, African diasporic religions. And then um, let's see. Oh, in terms of like the distinction, yeah, I think that is actually going to depend too. Um, <laughs> I think uh, like evangelicals, like depending on the, I would, I'm just going to give my family as an example, um, they would absolutely never <laughs> condone what I'm doing. <laughs> they think of me very negatively, the evangelical part of my family because of my religious beliefs. Um, so, you know, I think that of course there's going to be that distinction within families. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the teachings and beliefs of whatever kind of specific Christianity um, uh, that person um, um, subscribes to. Um, and then thinking more so about the tensions of the liberate the liberatory kind of potential of these religions while also kind of taking it, are also being um, connected with these religions that were used as tools of colonization. I think that kind of it makes me think um, of Christina Sharp's work and thinking about the wake and the paradoxes of black life. And I think it's just a condition that seems like a paradox, but in reality, it's not a paradox. It's just how we've had to kind of live and survive, right? And so these paradoxes become sites of kind of liberation as well in the same way that the flesh was uh, taught in such a negative way, the flesh then becomes a site of liberation as well. So it's almost like a reclamation that happens um, through Christianity and through Christian ideology. And even if you think about uh, black Christian churches, right, the reclamation of these particular religions um, that were used for colonization, racism, uh, white supremacy, there still is a power of liberation within those spaces as well. Um, so that's something that I talk about within the um, broader chapter, but I think it's really important. Um, and I think it goes back to that idea of the paradox um, that Christina Sharp talks about of, of the wake, um, living in the wake after life of slavery. So. Thank you.
Um, and then gender, was there a specific? <laughs> I, mean, I was thinking, I was thinking that, you know, one of the sort of realities of, of Catholic experience, right, is this extremely mm. male hierarchy and this extremely active and, and powerful female laity that's doing a huge amount, right, especially as like the population of Catholic priests shrink. Um, evangelical Christianity also has really strong patriarchal tendencies that exist in maybe, may, maybe a little bit less of a sort of gender split there for a variety of reasons. And so I was curious about sort of, you know, where our, our practitioners of sort of the, and this could be different in obviously in various Afro-Caribbean traditions, right? But like, how, how does, how, I was wondering if this is if if this is a space that is more for or controlled by women and non-binary folks. If this is if this is sort of equally shared, how it exists in sort of tension with again more male hierarchical Christian spaces that people may also have allegiance to. And I guess like you got at this a little bit in what you were saying about sort of the various forms of Christianity, but I'm thinking about evangelical or born again traditions layering on top, like com coming into communities that are historically Catholic. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how that does or doesn't sort of affect people's practices and the rituals that are available to them because it, because it does, does it, you know, you sort of, in your answer suggested that it does start forcing a choice, but as, as the religious sort of, um, tenor of broader communities change in terms of their Christian allegiances, what happens in terms of this aspect of folks' ritual lives? Yeah, I think, um, so it's, it's also gonna primarily depend on the history of uh, the religious practices as well, but um, in terms of, I, African diasporic religions are often um, framed within having more uh, liberatory potentials for gender and sexuality um, because um, there are agender, non-gender deities. There are deities that have male, female past. There are, um, um, there is a um, inclusion. Are there are deities that specifically have queer people as their like children, right? So it's often seen um, as being a more liberatory space, but of course, the imposition of patriarchy plays a huge part in it. And so, for example, in Cuba, in the practice of Ifa in Lukumi of Lukumi, um, in um, women are only allowed to be priests up to a certain point. And so the highest priests of the religion are known as Baba Laos, and it can only be um, men that are Baba Laos. And that very much has to do with the kind of Christian Catholic um, um, orientation of what Cuba was um, with Lukumi and then with that, that practice as well. Um, and so on the other hand, in Brazil uh, with Candomblé, um, which also is an IFA practice, so they're coming from very similar backgrounds, um, women are allowed to be high priest. Um, that restriction isn't allowed, and a lot of that actually has to do with the fact that there was a point in time in Brazil's history in which during slavery, um, a lot of the men were taken and killed, and so the only people left were uh, women, and so they had to do a lot of the divining that at that point was only for, for men. Um, and so now you see in Brazilian Candomblé Ifa practice where women can be high priests, um, whereas in Lukumi, still that's not the case. So definitely these patriarchal um, gender kind of uh, hierarchies exist within the religion and kind of are just depend as well um, on on the specific region that it's coming from. I wonder if we could I could take you in a slightly different <clears throat> direction. Um, so I know you know during the pandemic a lot of religions in some ways moved online. We have religious practices, everything from like virtually lighting a candle to puja to whole you know liturgies and masses and things. Did we? Did you find any of that? And and then could you reflect on if those types of practices existed in these traditions? Um, how does that like? How do they fit with what you just said about the camera and then like the engagement of the viewer and all these things that were very intentional in your filmmaking, 
but in these types of, you know, I mean, are there live streams of altar building or something that don't capture that, but nevertheless are still acting upon the people participating in them? Mm -hmm. I'd just be interested to hear about that. Yeah, there was definitely that shift as well. Um, I think more broadly, just within the social media age, um, a lot of African diasporic religions have seen somewhat of a revival in that these practices, which have uh, historically been hidden, a little bit difficult to get access to or know about, are now online. And there's people who are proudly proclaiming, proclaiming themselves as witches when like before that would have been, <laughs> nobody would have said that, right? Um, so I think that that is one aspect aspect as well. And, um, and one of the books that I talked about in um, my lecture, um, Electric Santaria, um, she is actually talking about a time of technology that's not even at this point. She's talking about when people would like record it and then give tapes, you know. So even through that process of technology, she was arguing that these kind of spiritual currents had the, um, had the potential to be relayed beyond uh, local um, locations themselves. And so um, with social media, I think there's even more of a proliferation where, um, you know, the sharing of ritual is just so much more easier. Um, and so I do think that that aspect of the technology still applies to it. The intentionality is probably not there in that same way. Um, but I think there is that kind of uh, foundational belief that, like, these these rituals will have an effect on whoever sees it. And so a lot of times I'll see like people who do tarot practice and they'll say like, if you stopped on this video, it's because it was meant for you, you know? So it's like the ideal is that these ritual practices can be relayed even in this kind of social media age. And so I think people are shifting very much to that as well. And also thinking with the framework that um, the, the spiritual, components can also be shared and liked on Facebook and Instagram. Um, so that's definitely one aspect of it. Um, and then, um, sorry, I think there's a second part to your question that I didn't write down. Okay. No, that was pretty much it, thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, Elena, can, oops, let's see. Well, can I push the gender question um, towards your own work? Uh, and I, it, it, I mean, the clip you showed us was so, Moving. I mean, I think we were just all on the verge of tears. And that um, kind of exploration of female friendship is not something that is a, a common uh, subject of, of film. Um, so I wanted to ask just about, um, and you showed us only female filmmakers, about your sense of... Um, gender in relation to the practice that you are documenting of film as ritual? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the reason why I focus on women and non-binary people is uh, because thinking about this kind of understanding, which we know that these religions are not, um, cannot escape these systems of patriarchy and sexism and transphobia, et cetera, um, still within these ritual spaces that are supposed to be for liberation, women and non-binary people still find spaces of liberation even within those structures that are suppressing within this liberatory space. Um, and so I see that as something that's really important to focus on to see how um, black, queer, uh, women, non-binary people are using um, art and ritual, ritual art in particular. Um, so with the film, um, you know, I think that the, yeah, I, I think that's something that's come up a lot of the ideal that, you know, we really don't get to see this kind of intimacy. And I think I'm drawn to um, Audre Lorde's work of the erotic and thinking about, um, how we redefine the erotic, not just for something that is like sexual, right? But what does it mean for like a friendship to live within the space of the erotic, where um, it is not just about the sexual or the romantic, but it's also about the kind of um, purest feeling of uh, self of the flesh, right, of uh, joy and ecstasy and all of those moments that come with friendship. So rather than limiting that friendship through, you know, in the film I talk about like the different kind of structures that I had to navigate within um, our friendship of ableism and I think um, what does it mean to even make a friendship and then patriarchy and sexism, all of these kind of confine the relationships that we have and in particular relationship between women um, um, that are not romantic and so um, I wanted to really focus on that um, 
just like allowing it to fully be what it was without being afraid that people might think like, oh, I wonder if people are gonna be like, oh, they were, it doesn't matter to me because what I want to come through is the love, whatever that looks like for people or whatever that means to people. Um, so that I think is a, a really important underline of, uh, of all of the work that I'm doing is that focus um, specifically on women and non-binary people, queer, black artists, um, and how we use art to create these spaces, how we use ritual, even when sometimes these are not the safest spaces for us, um, even when people say they should be safe, or ideally they should be safe, right? How we still are trying to create spaces of liberation. And for me, that is the practice of liberation and the potential of creating liberatory futures. And I think you really accomplished that Thank you. in the film that we saw. We want to see the rest. <laughs> My question is some kind of really related to what Anne asked. Um, your, your movie was a silent movie, and I want to know how much it was intentional and conscious, conscious that you made the movie in a silent genre. And is the black ritual film genre oh, the, the dominant, is it dominant? that they are silent. Because I think when, as an audience, when I watch this movie in, in a silent mode, I, I can have more empathy with it. Mm -hmm. And I think when there is no word, the movie speaks more and more deeply and invites more um, audiences to be involved in that movie. And also, I think that it, um, reflects the historical silence of mm. women and the non-binary people who, who didn't have any voice throughout the history of art. Um, so I want to know if this silent genre, silence genre, the dominant genre in black ritual movies, or your special animation was like that, and I enjoyed it. it, it this dialogical nature, would be more effective when there is no word here. Thank you. Um, that's that was very helpful to think with. Um, so the whole film itself is not silent, it's just that scene. Um, so the film is like 23 minutes, um, and then that scene that we saw is the ending scene of the film. Um, and so the film is like, it's a very heavy film, it's a very emotional film. If you just saw that clip and wanted to cry, wait until you see the whole film. <laughs> um, it's very heavy, and it's, it's something that like I have to, um, have to be very intentional about showing um, and even like doing meditative and breath work with people after they watch it because of how heavy it is. Um, so that particular scene we made silent uh, because we wanted it to just be a space for people to breathe. Even though there's so much going on there, it's still like a space where you could just, after all of what you just taken in, to just kind of, and just kind of think about everything that's happened. And so there, there was an intentionality with that particular silence for the film, but also at the same time you hear like the music in the background, that's part of the sensory environment and the visuals, all of it's kind of coming together to create a more meditative space rather than trying to um, over explain something. And so I think um, in a lot of ways, I guess one aspect of black ritual film that I see as really significant is that because it, it's more on the experimental side, it doesn't rely on traditional kinds of storytelling methods uh, to try to over-explain or fit stories within a kind of uh, coherent whole, right? Instead, it's allowing it to be fragmented, it's allowing it to be silent, it's allowing it to be something that, it, it's allowing it to be shaped by the audience in a lot of ways. And so that's kind of one of the aspects that I think um, is important is that the audience, be, the way that the audience becomes more active is that we're not trying to have you take one specific message away. It's whatever it is that you take away, and it's gonna be so different for each person, right? So there's not a collective audience experience, it's more like an individual audience experience that's gonna very much depend on where you are in that moment you're watching it, your experiences, your life, your history, all of those things are gonna come into, into play. Um, and so I think those are important aspects of black ritual film is the 
ability to allow the audience to be more active within the meaning making of the film. Just like when you go to an altar, you may not necessarily get the same thing that somebody else does, right? But nonetheless, um, you're getting what it is that you need out of it. Um, and that's what I see as the work of Black Ritual Film. Yeah. Um, we are out of time. <laughs> the time flew by, Elena. The, you showed us like just a few minutes of that film, and I think we will, you know, we it will grip us forever. So um, we will have to work out some way for you all to be able to see this film. I think that's an opportunity we can't uh, can't let you leave HDS <laughs> without doing that so we'll get to work on that but please join me in thanking her Thank you. Thank you for your engagement and happy Halloween, Day of the Dead, the Lolo Muerto, whatever you <laughs> whatever you practice. <laughs> Thank you. Sponsor: Women's Studies and Religion Program. Copyright 2023. The President and Fellows of Harvard College.